what's in store for the future of Houston. Good evening, everyone. I'm Linda Laurel. Welcome to Red, White and Blue. Last fall in her ninth citywide race, Anise Parker was reelected to her third and final term as Houston mayor. From keeping the Houston economy growing while the U.S. was in a recession to what some saw as mismanaging the controversial red light issue, Mayor Parker's terms have seen their share of peaks and valleys. Because of term limits, of course, Parker will be unable to run for a fourth term as mayor of Houston. So tonight we ask, what does Mayor Parker have in store for Houston in this, her final term? And what are her own future political plans? We are pleased to welcome Mayor of the City of Houston, Anise Parker. And leading our discussion, as always, our hosts, David Jones and Gary Pollan. Well, welcome, Mayor. And I think, as David said, you know, you're up there in the, with the record holders of the number of times you appeared on the show. And I, I think the first question for you today... I'm just a glutton for punishment, no, obviously. Well, <laughs> the first question is going to be a real softball. What are your priorities for your last term in office? Good fiscal management of the city, which includes uh, continuing to try to make progress on pensions, uh, moving us forward in our uh, overhaul of infrastructure in the city, continuing to grow the economy, and then there's some uh, personally important issues. One is that uh, we have one of the best initiatives on homelessness anywhere in the United States, and I absolutely believe we can end uh, chronic homelessness and veterans homelessness in Houston by the time I'm out of office. We are, uh, I'm committed to expanding recycling, uh, curbside recycling citywide before I leave office, and uh, we will finalize our uh, transition to an independent crime lab uh, while I'm in office. And some of those are, you've, you've begun on in your earlier terms, and nothing's new here that you're talking about. Uh, were you dissatisfied that you weren't able to lay out an agenda in the last campaign and sh sell your candidacy on some of the matters that you're talking about now. I mean, you just, you just. I didn't think a landslide victory tells you that <laughs> yeah, I was you, able but, to but convince what, voters that. Sure. Uh, that but you uh, did it by, but, but you did it did it by exploiting the character flaws of the other candidate. You didn't really talk oh, about your works. future agenda. But since you got reelected, we've seen a wage theft uh, ordinance. We've seen a payday lending regulation. Both, we've both of which were in place. Uh, we were working on before the election. And I'm sure you could have got them done whenever you wanted to. You yes. also had same-sex benefits that you've just uh, provided. I have and not provided same-sex benefits. I've provided spousal benefits, which is different. There you go. Y'all are both lawyers, so I know you know the language matters. Uh, but, but, but I was going to say partner benefits. The purpose yeah. of my spousal question is, is that you, you now appear to many people as having been and probably Gary too, a liberal in disguise, and now your 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 true liberal, you know, views are going to be coming out in the last term. I am a fiscally conservative, social progressive. I've always been that. Uh, none of the things that I'm working on should be a surprise to anybody. There are things that I strongly telegraphed, and again, you mentioned wage theft and uh, payday lending, and we were we were working on those b before the election. It just sometimes the it gets the politics of council get complicated, and you set things aside before you move forward. The uh, recognizing legal marriages of, of city employees that was precipitated by a Supreme Court si decision that didn't come down till the middle of the year. So s some of these things are driven by events outside of my control. And of course, you have a crackshot legal team to oppose that Woodfill guy, don't you, uh, on these issues uh, that he brought well, in a lawsuit? Well, I have a very, very uh, competent and experienced uh, city attorney who is handling it himself. Yeah. Yes. I wasn't surprised at that outcome. Okay. Good. All right. I want to talk about something that there's no, there's no liberal or conservative policy when it comes to potholes. And the biggest complaint... I Streets told, in Houston are terrible, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. And I told people, you were coming on, I said, what would you like me to potholes. ask the mayor? And the number one topic was potholes. What is the They're number one everywhere. thing I'm asked about at uh, cocktail parties and in the grocery store okay. line? Potholes. In fact, we have a picture online. Actually, this is a picture at uh, Bissonette and Chimney Rock. <laughs> and uh, in this picture, you see it, It's uh, it was patched with originally with blacktop, which uh, we all know is a dumb way to do it. And of course, it didn't work. Uh, so uh, this goes back to the infrastructure fee, and, and it's something I thought was very important, thought it was called for because I didn't think, and, and you, you, of course, obviously, Green was mm -hmm. a leader on this, that the city had the resources it needed to take care of its infrastructure and flooding problems, and it needed more revenue to do so. So, And the people voted for it, understanding they were going to get that. So the question I'm getting now is, well, we are paying more for the infrastructure fee, yet our roads are getting worse and worse. So what's going on? So I'll let you answer the question because you're in charge. We are doing more 
road construction than we have in decades, in fact, ever in the history of Houston. We have 100 million more dollars a year to, to put into road reconstruction. We're, but the roads are getting worse and worse at the same time uh, for two reasons. We have underfunded infrastructure for decades. Uh, you know, Mayor Lanier came in and put blacktop on everything. Uh, blacktop has a limited lifespan. We never went back and fixed those roads. And so we, we wallpapered over some things that we never went back and fixed. And then we had the drought of 2011 that caused soil movement under the, under the roads. And so we have conditions that have precipitated a huge number of potholes to, to pop out on top of decades of underfunding. I have hundreds of, uh, you know, another $100 million a year that's generated by the drainage fee. I have a billion dollars worth of projects out there. But the other thing that happened when we passed the drainage fee is that we went pay as you go. It's the right thing to do fiscally. It's the conservative thing to, to, thing to do fiscally. But it means that we can't take advantage of the incredibly cheap uh, money that's available out there to borrow. And uh, under normal circumstances, I would be leveraging the, the heck out of, say if I had a drainage fee, plus I could borrow money, we'd be doing 10 times the number of projects. But we are paying cash for what we're doing, and it's going to slow it down. Can we, can we look forward to repairing the roads with cement as opposed to blacktop? Because you know it doesn't work, just like, of course, our and picture you, showed as an example. You have to understand, there's, there's three different levels of what we do. We go out and we fill the pothole. We go out and we, we, we do a repair, a larger repair, and then we do a complete reconstruction. The cement is the complete reconstruction. I still have to get out there and put whatever in the, in the pothole so that we can drive on it until we get to the place where we can do the complete reconstruction. So the, the, the answer is with a, a billion dollars in projects needed, uh, the citizens of Houston need to be patient. Citizens of, Houston, <laughs> citizens of Houston need to be patient, but they also need to, they need to engage. There are 16,000 lane miles in the city of Houston, 16,000 miles of road. And unless a citizen calls in a pothole to 311 or a city employee that's in the right place and is inclined to report it, hits it, we don't know it's there. And it's, uh, I know this happens all the time. People will hit a pothole day after day after day after day after day, and every time they hit it, they'll say something ugly about the city, <laughs> and we do not know that pothole is there. Uh, why don't you Once just tell them? Once a pothole is reported, uh, we, we expect to get it repaired within 48 hours. Why don't you just tell them to fill it themselves? I mean, you know, we've got, some, we've got people that don't have a lot to do in this town. <laughs> uh, they should be filling their, some of their own potholes. Now, but Gary and I have each been lobbied for different things since we have let the word out that you're gonna be here. The lobbying that I got, was in the uh, the uh, animal rights community, mm -hmm. and they sent me your platform statement from 2009, where you said that the Bureau of Animal Regulation and Care was just a disaster, mm -hmm. and that you knew about it when you were a controller. And there was and it, there very was an controller. explicit promise to that group of people that you would bring us up to standard in terms of having a no-kill shelter policy with an expert actually having brought in, having been brought in by someone to so, show how you could do it. And apparently it's not doable. Well, we did bring in uh, one of the acknowledged experts, Nathan Winograd. We have, uh, we're putting more money into BARC. <laughs> I, you know, that's money I could put on streets, by the way. <laughs> mm. And putting more money into Bureau of Animal Regulation Care than we ever have in the past. We've upgraded the staff. We have uh, significantly increased our live release rate and decreased the number of animals we uh, euthanize. We are on the way toward a no-kill shelter. What people have to understand is that there's never going to be a municipal animal shelter that doesn't have to euthanize some animals, either vicious animals, they are, they're severely injured animals. And they understand animals. That. They understand uh, But uh, we're, we're, we're doing innovative things. We have an, a relationship. We're now sending our animals off to Colorado. Uh, because we've, uh, we have an, uh, a relationship with an animal shelter group up, up there. They don't have the, the stray dog problem that we have down here. Uh, I'm not done with Bark, uh, but uh, it is in a better place than it was when I came into office, and it'll be a better place when I leave. Just Maybe make you David, save one. David needs to adopt some more dogs. Uh, yeah. Just, just make sure you save the yellow dogs, okay? 
Yes, <laughs> yeah, I like that. Well, next next topic. That I, I adopted one of the bark animals uh, recently. So ah, that's very good. Uh, one of the other things that was has been mentioned and concern is executive orders, and of course, there's a lot of concern among people on my side of the aisle about the extensive use of executive orders by President Obama, where they think he's just basically running the country by fiat, and the legislature, Congress, doesn't matter anymore. And then they said, well, in Mayor Parker, it seems to be doing the same thing. We have an executive order on partner benefits. We have an executive order on uh, employee relations. We have executive order and this and that. And why? Um, and the question was why? Why all of a sudden do we have these executive orders and not going to council or, in the case of partner benefits, going back to a vote of the uh, citizens? I have not given partner benefits. <coughs> City of Houston is not allowed by charter to offer domestic partner benefits, and that has not changed. I also didn't ex issue an executive order. I. Uh, sent a clarifying memo to my HR department saying the Supreme Court has acknowledged that same-sex marriages that are legal in the state of origin are legal under federal law and uh, I said we'll recognize those to follow federal law. Uh, I haven't issued a, uh, a to my knowledge, uh, a controversial executive order uh, since the beginning of my term four years ago when I issued an executive order on the treatment of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered uh, employees and those who uh, come to city facilities. You, every mayor issues uh, executive orders. I have not uh, issued uh, a number that's uh, out of line with my predecessors. Would it have been more appropriate to take that issue to the city council, It's for not example? something that council would vote on. Okay. Well, well, it's right. an, uh, this is a strong mayor system. Uh, it is, uh, and that is a, it, it's not a change of ordinance, it's a change, it's a recognition of policy, it's not something that... So you don't think it runs afoul of the uh, ordinance that was passed by the voters of the city? No, the, the language in the city charter is very, very specific, and it says that uh, benefits shall only be offered to the legal spouses of city employees, and it uses that phrase. And so I'm looking at the charter language and I see legal spouses. Okay, mm -hmm. if you're not married, you don't get the benefits. This okay. is about the rebranding of the Republican Party. Uh, you understand uh, these questions. I just so, asked the question. <laughs> so, Mayor, too late. Mayor uh, <laughs> regarding, regarding the fiat uh, problem at the uh, executive level in Washington, let's move it back here locally to the, the issue that he's, uh, Gary's Im implying is, is important to him, and that is the health care. Uh, executive orders. Now, so but what I want to know Healthcare about executive orders. Well, you know, Obama says ah. he's going to excuse uh, businesses for another year. Those sorts. I of have things. nothing to do with that. Oh, I know that, but you can tell <laughs> us what the city is doing to help the most uninsured population in the country and in the most economically <laughs> it's segregated actually, it's city. It's not just the city of Houston. Who's going to help it them get insured? Who's going to get them? It's the city of Houston. Applied? The city of Houston and Harris County, and you can't say that you know Harris County is completely controlled by uh, Republicans. Uh, and we have joined together to try to get people enrolled under so-called Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, because guess what? If they don't have that insurance coverage, then it's our local county tax dollars that, uh, that pay the bill. You know, I stood up with uh, County Judge Ed Emmett, and we made a pledge to do our best to get people enrolled under these private insurance policies. Because so it saves it saves local tax so dollars. So you've dedicated some city resources to I have dedicated outreach. some city resources to outreach. Uh, existing city personnel working with uh, those organizations that were hired under the uh, Affordable Care Act by the uh, at the federal level. Do so you have any luck signing up any people for real programs? Uh, we've signed up several hundred thousand folks here in the greater history. Is that Medicaid or are they in real insurance plans? Some of them are real in real insurance plans. I mean, you say Medicaid uh, because the state decided not to participate in the, the Medicaid waiver, uh, there are lots of, we're still gonna have a lot of uninsured folks who really cannot afford these plans, but are not currently under state law eligible for, for Medicaid, and there's several million Texans that are gonna fall into the gap because I, in my view, the, our governor's playing politics. And, and to follow up with Gary's uh, discussions and forced discussions about um, benefits packages and the like, and whether they're appropriate to be granting, I want to congratulate you on your marriage, and yet I have a question mm -hmm. from a viewer. But she's not taking, they're not taking benefits. Though. Yeah, no, that's right. <laughs> and the question from the viewer is that, you know, you said you were, you know, you might wait until Texas made it possible for you to do it here. And so the question from this viewer, friendly viewer, was how long do you think he and others like him and the cheese are going to have to wait? 
for so that they could be married in Texas. I think this issue is going to resolve, be resolved within the next couple of years. And uh, I had always said I was going to wait until I could do it in Texas. I think it's offensive that I had to go to another state to uh, marry someone who shared my life for, for 23 years, more than 23 years. Uh, but after the Supreme Court ruling this summer, uh, the, the first, to, to tell you the truth, the, the Supreme Court ruling came down, the first person to call me was our youngest daughter, who's 18, and she said, are y'all going to get married now? And I said, uh... There's a pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. and I had to think about it and the messages that we're, we're sending to our kids and uh, what it might mean if the dominoes continue to fall as they have, uh, I don't know that it may... There are half measures that the Supreme Court can take, but clearly at a federal level, my marriage is fully recognized, and it was uh, that step was important for me to go ahead and do it. Did you get married in California? Got married in California. Okay, well, so you had a nice trip at least, right? I did. Okay. I got, I'm going to go off this. I'm going to talk about something else that's in, actually in the news currently, deregulating taxis. This, the, the, the critics are saying Houston has the most overregulated, expensive taxi market in the country. And I don't know whether that's true or not, but we I want to get We do not have the most comments. expensive taxi market in the country. We do have a heavily re re regulated taxi market. Uh, taxis are, are regulated nationwide as a, essentially as a public utility uh, for having... Uh, access to a limited number of slots to operate taxis and committing to providing service anywhere for a set fee, you have a sort of a protected monopoly. Uh, Uber, Lyft, some other companies have come out with technology that makes, uh, that, that, that's been a game changer. Uh, it's not easy to unwind decades of regulation. Uh, I presented to, to City Council uh, an analysis of the industry and what we think needs to change in order to allow companies like Uber and Lyft in. Uh, Council's going to have to go through the ordinance. You know, uh, I certainly have an, uh, an opinion, uh, but this is, Council wants the authority to vote on things. They're going to have the authority to vote on whether we deregulate the taxi industry. There still has to be some strictures that say you can't refuse to send a taxi into uh, a neighborhood if Houston is considered unsafe. Uh, we, we still have to have regulations that say you have to have insurance, you have to have a background check, you have to uh, prove that your vehicle is safe and th that's regularly inspected. So you're not going to deregulate the industry completely. You, trying to figure out a way to allow the benefits of this new technology, but, but, but still saying you can't redline areas of Houston and not send taxis in. Have you, have you seen any uh, cities that you would model uh, the way you'd California like to The California PUC is actually doing some very thoughtful and thorough rulemaking. Uh, one of the things that causes me the most heartburn, Uber, for example, it's a great, easy service. Uber doesn't provide insurance. And they use, and the, the reason they don't provide any kind of insurance uh, for their, th those who use their service is they say, we're contracting with existing livery vehicles. They have insurance, they're inspected. We're just, we're just a technical app that connects the, the rider to the uh, company. But Uber Black uses existing limos. They contract directly with the driver. Most of the drivers don't actually own the vehicle. So I'm the owner of, of a fleet of Blacktown cars, and I hire out hire drivers to drive my cars. My drivers get an iPhone from Uber, and they're running trips on the side. They have a horrible accident. They kill somebody. I don't know they're running. I've not gotten the benefit of whatever fare mm -hmm. they receive because they're, they're moonlighting on the side. And it's my insurance that's going to pay for this accident. That's why this is not easy to unwind. And this is not this is uber minutia to me. So I'm sorry. It's fascinating. I, it, it's, it's it's not so. David so overrides the cab, Mayor. So um, regarding the, the the early decisions regarding wage theft and payday lending, there is another one that y you you know, in my view, there should be a courthouse to the White House agenda for Democrats. And you're you're at the local level, 
<laughs> and at the national level, the president is saying, if you contract with the federal government, you better pay a living wage. City of Houston you, already, the city can of you Houston, do that? The city of Houston already pays a $10 minimum wage to anybody who works for the city of Houston. Well, how about, how about people who get contracts for the city of Houston? I don't believe that the city should unilaterally make these decisions. I actually think that the minimum wage should be set at the federal level so there's a la level playing field uh, across the board. But as a city, and this is not something I did by fiat, this is something that we voted on, we established a minimum wage for all city employees. But w you would agree that if you could leverage those contractors to pay a higher wage, assuming that you know what that sort of median wage is that they're paying right now, that it could lift all boats in terms of the economy as they uh, pay their workers more money. Than I, I think a higher minimum wage is appropriate, but I don't think it should be done on a be a spotty regional basis. I think it should be. I should think it should be a yeah. nationwide. Decision. David Plan just guarantees the city gets to spend more money. Well, That's what everybody's it does. got new. Look at the county. You need new revenue. County's got a lot that. of. County has a lot of new money. I just saw their budget. They paid a lot of people. They higher. gave each other. They gave each other pay raises. I don't vote on my own pay raise. Or that my own comes pay. by the legislature. Yeah. Okay. It's uh, a, It's it's a it's fixed to whatever the legislature gives uh, judges. Speaking of revenue. Uh, there was, there's been stories recently about criticism of the Harris County Appraisal District stating that they grossly here, here. under, under, under uh, appraise business properties as All compared to residential. All hail Harris County for, for, for up in the ante over there. I, I that obviously costs the city money because you, the people are, if they're not paying their fair share, the the not it, honest appraisals. We had known this was going to be was a problem for a long time, and the solution to the problem is one is is a mandatory sales price disclosure, which most states have, and the state legislature has refused to to grant here in Texas, uh, and. Uh, that would mean that, because that's what really what happens with uh, residential property that, that changes hands. There's a, there's a mortgage, there's a report, we know what it changed hands at, and that, so re residential property is fixed very close to its actual value. It's these big commercial properties that uh, <coughs> once they, it, a lot of them have changed hands recently and go on the books for many times what they were uh, appraised at. But there's another thing that, and so that we, we missed all that revenue while they were at the ultra low appraisal, but there's another element that comes in and that is the ability to go in and protest. And the first one goes in and protests and, and brings their appraisal down even below what they just paid for it. And then the next one comes in <coughs> and, 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 and keys off of that and you have a ratcheting down effect. So I salute the county's uh, suit and their, their willingness to dig into this. Is this in your future uh, for Houston, uh, Mayor Parker? Uh, some of your most dedicated supporters right before the last election were, were attempting to force a vote on pre-K education and a one cent dedicated tax to pay for it. I mean, people who really are on your side in most political arguments. Uh, Wendy Davis is now for full day pre-K uh, statewide, but can't you do anything to, in using that last coalition to deliver uh, pre-K education to uh, to s kids in Houston? I, I certainly support the premise that investing in in pre-K education mm -hmm. is one of the most cost-effective things we can do to improve educational outcomes, to lower our crime rate, to uh, improve the economic outlook for the the region, but it, there's not anything directly in my purview as as mayor. Uh, we have initiative and referendum in the city of Houston, and they were trying to do it a, a, as a county, but there's no mechanism to to spend any tax revenue that would be generated. I don't. That's why that, that's why also they were doing it at the county. So, so the short answer is. I, I'm very sympathetic, but I have nothing. But you're uh, recommending they go initiative and referendum through, no, through the city. No, I'm saying that that there's no there's no easy way to do what they want to do. Okay, but, ma Mayor. One of the things that Linda said at the beginning was we'd ask you about your political future. So ah. here's your chance. If you'd like to comment, uh, do you have any future political plans, or you just plan to finish your term as mayor and see what opportunities open up? I plan to finish my term as mayor and see what opportunities open up. I do not have any. Uh, any plans? Um, I don't have a, a race that I have my sights on. I'm going to run through the tape as mayor. I would like to continue to serve the public. I see myself uh, 
standing for other political office someday, but I can't speculate on what it is. You could be the first mayor to ever do anything if that were to work I, out. I would like to be. <laughs> in a, 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 you know, I, what happens it is never that, happened. What happens is that being a big city mayor spoils you. Uh, <laughs> I am. Uh, yeah, you, know, you can you can take this one to the bank. I'm not going to be running for Congress. I can understand uh, that. Be, <laughs> yeah, mayors, ma cities have to function, and mayors take action every day. I'm not. I don't have much tolerance for talking about things. I want to do things, and so yeah. it would have to be an executive. Well, well, Parker, here she goes. Yes, could be. <laughs> Mayor Parker, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, as always, uh, very insightful, Linda. Okay. We learned a lot. There we is did. a future we for Denise Parker. We just don't know what it is. Great conversation. Thank you so much, Mayor. <laughs> and remember, you can catch Red, White, and Blue every Friday at 7:30 p.m. right here on Channel 8, and again Saturdays at 6:30 p.m. We also invite you to visit us online and send us your comments. We want to hear what you are saying about the issues that affect Houston. You can submit your comments at HoustonPBS.org or on Facebook. And while you're there, don't forget to like us. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you again next week. Good night.